And now I would like to welcome Roman Jangarber from University of Finland. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, uh, so uh, thank you, Roman. And yeah, we are happy to hear about your work on linguistic knowledge and generative language modeling. Thank you. Um, so the title of the talk is Why Linguistically Informed Segmentation is Crucial for Generative Language Modeling. And it's work that's done in the University of Helsinki with, with my team. Um, so a little bit of background. Uh, the key points here, language modeling is a fundamental task in natural language processing. So NLP is everything that has to do with language technology. Nowadays, language models are at the center of that. And segmentation or tokenization is a fundamental step in language modeling. So kind of becomes very central to everything. Uh, I will use the terms, uh, uh, Marco was using the term segmentation, which is the term I prefer as well. But in fact, the whole world calls it tokenization. So for the rest of this talk, I will just talk about tokenization, but it's really the same thing. Um, and the problem that we find is today in 2024, very few studies, I mean, I'm very happy to see Marco's work and, and Senya's work, but very, very few studies have focused on how exactly this subword tokenization segmentation, right? affects the performance of language models, including large language models, such as ChatGPT. Uh, one caveat here, by morphological, uh, for this talk, for the duration of this talk, I will it'll be understood in broad sense, right? It'll include all word formation processes, including inflection, uh, derivation, uh, criticization, adding critics, compounding, everything. So we'll just call all of that morphology. Okay. So getting back to our three points, language modeling uh, can be construed as basically as, as the task of predicting the next word or the task of, you know, you're given some context and you have to fill in the, the, the blank. Maybe the, it could be the uh, following word or a blank in the middle of the context. But that's, that's fundamentally what a language model, uh, what defines a language model. Uh, now, it's, it's at the center of everything that we do nowadays in, uh, with uh, deep learning uh, uh, language, uh, la language models uh, that are used for everything. Um, so how do we, you know, what, 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 what do we mean by predicting the next word? So the, the naive approach is to just say each word in language is a separate so-called token and use it inside the model, okay? The problem with that, you meet very soon when people, actually people started doing things like that, but very quickly we discovered that uh, the lexicon of language is just too large. If it's Slavic languages, Finnish language, and many other languages, in English you might almost get away with it. But for most other languages in the world, it's, it, it's, it's quite impossible because of heavy morphology, right? So the number of actual distinct words is just, is just uh, far too big. That's one problem. The second problem is what Marco, Marco mentioned, which is words that you've never seen before. Just because you haven't seen a word before doesn't mean that you can afford to ignore it or not to model. Okay, so for, for these two reasons, uh, what, what we say is that we need to reduce this enormous uh, vocabulary that's possible in language to a manageable size. And so that's where this whole idea of tokenization comes in, right? We want to split all the words into smaller pieces, we call them tokens, uh, and then get a uh, reasonable size lexicon. So how do people tokenize words today? Uh, they use BPE. Every, inside ChatGPT, inside all the, you know, all the models that you see on the market today, uh, there is this uh, method for splitting words into subword tokens. BPE stands for byte pair encoding. It's a basic, uh, very simple algorithm that was invented some time ago for a completely different purpose. And the algorithm is really, really simple. It works like this. So the starting lexicon, which is your inventory of tokens, is just the characters in the language. Uh, the next step is you say, okay, I'm going to find the most frequent pair of tokens in my gigantic corpus. Which pair of tokens occurs uh, most frequently? And then I take that pair and I merge it and I create a new token. And I add it to my lexicon and then I just continue indefinitely. Uh, I decide when I want to stop. Let's say I want to stop at lexicon is uh, 50,000 or 100,000. And, and th then I use that to do all my language modeling. Notice that in this way, I can encode any word whatsoever. So that's one approach. And of course, as Marco already observed, sometimes it 
doesn't segment words at all. Sometimes it segments words correctly from the point of view of our linguistic intuitions morphologically. Sometimes it gives complete nonsense like this clever rest. This, this is actually, this is from a, a very nice talk on the internet by, uh, from a channel called uh, Three Blue, One Brown. It's a fantastic resource. I really strongly recommend it. They have a, um, a series of, of lectures on, on deep, uh, uh, deep learning language modeling. Anyway, this is a real example from BPE. So instead, we are going to uh, pr propose, uh, similar to Marco's work, I, I'm very grateful for you having, <laughs> having done an introduction. I, have to, I don't have to give so much detail. Um, so we have an alternative approach. We test several alternative approaches which are morphologically aware, which BP is not, right? Um, in particular, we talk about this uh, one method called state morph, which tries to model uh, this uh, tokenization process as a finite state machine, which is how people very frequently uh, for a long time now, since, since the 80s, have been representing morphology and language. So a finite state machine works like this, that you have states, and inside the states there are little lexicons that emit uh, mor morphemes, and then you have certain probabilities of, of going from one state to the next. So you might start in this state, and then you might generate a noun, let's say computer, and from here you might, by adding a suffix, you get computerize, and from, from there you might add another suffix, you get computerization, or you might decide to go this way and you might get computerizable or computerizability and so on, right? You might have a, a path here that says uh, um, inform, a verb like inform, and then you get informative, informativeness or informatively and so on. So you glue pieces together, and you, right? This is a very common way. We didn't invent this very old thing. But what we'd like to do is to develop methods that learn this from the data in an unsupervised way, with no supervision at all. So no, uh, no manually annotated uh, examples to learn from. So one algorithm is called state morph that I'll introduce very briefly here. It's also developed by, by my team, also uh, quite so many years ago. So the goal is to learn this finite state machine for a language with no supervision. And the algorithm, um, right, it's going to tokenize a word list so we have a gigantic word list from a corpus, all the distinct words that we found in the corpus. And it works very simply like this. Well, actually, it's, mathematically, it's a bit complicated, but I can tell you the details about it later. Um, so the idea is you first initialize everything randomly. So you chop up the words randomly and throw them into these states that you saw in this picture here, completely randomly. And now you have kind of a, I mean, it's, it's very bad, but you have a model of morphology. And now we, we use this uh, expectation maximization alg uh, algorithm, which is uh, very, you know, it, it, it's a theoretically very well-founded way of, of doing things. And uh, the way it works is now it's, we say now we have a model. So based on that, we can, based on the current, sorry, I apologize. Based on the current tokenization that we have now just chopped up all the words, we can create a model which will look like this. Right? But based on this model, we can re-tokenize the uh, data uh, by simply following the roots. Okay, so we get a new tokenization. And this expectation maximization, the, the theory behind it, tells us that we are guaranteed that if we keep repeating this process, the, uh, the, the quality of the, um, of the splits, the quality of the model, is guaranteed to improve continuously. That's it. So we use that fact to, uh, to iterate uh, this process until it converges, until it stops. Uh, there's some tricks that are involved there because you might get stuck on a local optimum instead of the best possible solution, so there's ways to compensate for that, but this is basically the idea. So we now have an, uh, a automatic segmenter that, is, uh, that requires no training data, that is unsupervised. And if you compare the performance of BP, byte pair encoding, compared to state morph, you can see here, so in blue, I've highlighted the things that are kind of, that are offensive to our sense of morphology, right? So uh, in the worst case, look at, look at this. So BPE decides to, to segment harassing. This is real. This, BPE is what's inside ChatGPT today, right? This is how it analyzes that word. So it has H um, as a, as a token. So what's the problem with this? Um, based on H, you have to predict what's the, next, what's, what's the next token coming. That's gonna be very difficult, 
right? Because it could be a lot of stuff. But ChatGPT still manages to do that with you know, fantastic uh, performance, fantastic results. The point is that the fact that it recovers from this confusion, like what am I going to predict after H, um, just means one thing. It just means that there is a cost for that. You pay extra. No, it's the, the, the model, ChatGPT, will have to be bigger to compensate for this lack of information that is in the uh, tokenization that you have here. Okay? You can still do it, but it will cost more. So these are the four research questions now that we have in our, uh, in our, in, in this work. I'll try to go through them quickly. So as I said, very few studies focus on how this affects the performance of language models. The fact that we have these blue things which are quite nonsensical from the point of view of our intuitions about language. So the first question is, does this morphological tokenization help the language model achieve lower perplexity? So from a theoretical point of view, um, if we can show that, we're done. Lower perplexity means that the language model is less surprised to see the data, right? So the rule is, in, I mean, our theory tells us that if the language model uh, assigns higher probability to real world data, then that's a better language model. Right? So if, if, if I'm trying to sell you a language model and Senya is trying to sell you a language model, that's all you need to ask is does, does Senya's language model assign higher probability to the data that you show it than, than does mine? If it does, then you should buy hers, period. Okay, so that's the theoretical uh, foundation of what we do. But then there's also a very sensible way to ask a practical question. What, did, what, what do we gain by this in practical terms? And the answer is in the next research questions. One is, can we show that if we know, if we are aware of morphology, that we will converge more efficiently in terms of training time for this language model, right? Efficiently means that what? That if, if I spend less compute cycles, less electricity, cheaper, right? To train uh, one of the recent uh, chat GPT versions, I think GPT-4, uh, it cost $150 million just to train that machine. So this is a very, very real uh, cost that we have to take into account. Uh, another practical consideration is, okay, if you use morphology, um, can you show that you have better or at least equivalent performance on downstream tasks, whatever those tasks might be? We have hundreds of different tasks that we have in natural language processing. And last question is, can it help reduce model size? Well, it's related to number two. So again, is the performance of a language, mo language model of smaller size, but with morphological smart tokenization, is it comparable to li language models with larger size, but with this naive tokenizations? So this is what we pursue, and that's, what, that, that's what's done in the paper. So the experiments compared uh, initially, we compared four languages, with some of them with very heavy morphology. Um, actually, today, we have already worked through 40 different languages, so, but that hasn't been published yet. And we compared three tokenization algorithms, byte pair encoding is the one I told you about, and then uh, Morpheser is ours, and uh, sorry, Morpheser is another um, algorithm that was developed in Helsinki but some years ago, very similar to state morph, but some differences, and state morph is our latest thing. Okay. And we compared the performance of, of GPT um, the transformer model and BERT transformer model trained with uh, BP versus these uh, morphologically aware, morphologically aware um, tokenization algorithms. And I have lots of, lots of pictures and, and uh, uh, results here. This is, this is really quite enough to see. So if, if you look at this, so this is Finnish and the model is GPT here. And, uh, <clears throat> So if you track this, uh, the dashed lines are the morphological tokenization down here, and the uh, solid lines are BPE. And this is measuring perplexity. So this is basically how surprised the model is to see the next word. So the lower perplexity, the better the model. So you can see that the, uh, the dashed lines, which are morphologically aware uh, models that were trained with morphological tokenization, are much better than the solid lines up here. In a way, that's all you need to know. I, we, we can all go home. <laughs> uh, we, we, are, we are basically finished. Uh, there's one other key point here. Uh, so the black one is the, I'll skip ahead here. Um, the black, I can't see the colors very well, but the black ones are the uh, uh, larger models and the, no, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to confuse myself. 
Yeah, um, one other point here, the, we observe the same thing for, for, for the BERT models and for the GPT models. It, it doesn't matter, the, the, the result is always the same. Uh, I really can't see this. Uh, which is the slide I wanted to show you. Yeah, this one here. Um, so you can see here are the smaller models in black and the, lar uh, uh, the larger models in orange. So again, the dashed ones are the um, morphological segmentations and the uh, solid lines are the byte parent coding. So you can see that, right, when you go from the, uh, from the large model to the smaller model, you lose you lose performance, you get higher perplexity. Same, same way here, right? This is the larger model, this is the smaller model, the orange one. When we move from orange to black, it becomes worse, as expected. The model is smaller, so it performs worse. However, what you can see here is that the smaller model with the um, morphological segmentation still performs better than the larger model with byte parent coding. So those are, the, those are the, uh, the huge gains that I wanted to tell you about. Uh, the last point I would like to uh, highlight here is that this has direct impact on sustainability of these models, right? Because it burns less electricity um, and performs equally well or better, and therefore you, uh, yeah, it, it has very serious impacts going forwards in terms of uh, the costs, the, the carbon footprint that these models leave on the environment. So that's all I wanted to leave you with. Uh, I won't talk about downstream tasks. Uh, this is a summary of the, um, of the research questions, which are all answered in, in the affirmative. And if you have any questions, please uh, I'm welcome to either ask me here or contact by email. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roman, for this talk. So it's really in line with many debates that we have nowadays when uh, debates on large language models are really present. So are there any questions from the public? Yes, Jaka, please. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, you've actually debunked a statement that has bugged me for years now. Uh, I think it was 2019 or maybe 2018, someone was presenting a BERT model um, and I raised this question about the tokenization and whether it would help the model to use a different sort of tokenization that takes uh, morphology into account and they basically said very vehemently that it doesn't really matter and that it's very very um, it's actually better to just use this because I suppose the argument was that a more statistical approach takes into account um, some sorts of links that maybe you as a person do not take into account if you just focus on morphology yeah. so what is your opinion on that? I, I, my opinion is that that's just based in stupidity. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I, this, I know this is very impolite. No, but I agree. It, <laughs> it's, just, uh, it's just absurd. First, now we have experiments that prove it, and we're not the only ones. But the thing that stuns me is that we are, although we're not the only ones, we are very few. There's still, you know, you could count on your fingers the amount of work, we're now doing a survey paper on this. Uh, the amount of work that's been done is ridiculously low, and the amount of attention that's been paid to this is absurdly low compared to the amount of attention that, you know, uh, language modeling is getting. Uh, I don't know what this is due to. I suspect it's because people are just not educated in elementary linguistics. But I know that sounds like a very snobbish thing to, thing to say, but it's been very upsetting. We've been working on this for some years, and, you know, we find, uh, you know, we find like-minded colleagues uh, here and there, but the the majority of the field seems to be of this mindset that, you know, if my model is not performing better, I'm just going to make it bigger. That's the cool thing to do. You know, if my model is bigger than yours, it will probably perform better. But it's also, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a cooler thing. To me, it's, you know, it's just burning more, <laughs> burning more gas, burning more electricity. I'm really concerned about that. So, yeah. I mean, now that you have the numbers, and you know, I'm, I'm very happy uh, about this presentation. So thank you again. It's, um, it's been very enlightening. Yeah, I, I feel like we've been a little bit like fighting with min windmills. Mm -hmm. This, you know, sort of this mad scientist. But we have clear results here. The problem is that the, the, the field is just moving so fast and people are 
not aware of this. But there is, uh, as I said, there's already, uh, every year there's something that comes up where people say, maybe we should, maybe we should find better segments than, uh, you know, than these guys. Thank you very much. Any other question? Uh, so maybe just a short question, and then we close the session. So uh, from the downstream tasks on which you evaluated, uh, of course, we cannot go through all of them here, but is it for like linguistic public, is there one where you would explain um, which task can be improved like this? Like um, With the downstream tasks, we, we just focused on, on uh, how would I say, uh, the, the, yeah. Basically, it's all in the paper. We tr we tried topic classification. We mm. tried paraphrase. Yeah, so let's see. Paraphrase as standard tasks, and then we tried to. Um, uh, what else did we do? Topic classification. There's, I guess I only have two in the slides, but there's more of them. In the yeah. Paper. Uh, it's not so important, for, at least for us at this point. It's mm. not so important to prove that we can actually perform better on the. Um, on the downstream tasks. If we perform equally well, that's fine. With smaller model, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly, because we can have a smaller model that performs equally yeah. well. And that we can show. Yeah. Right, okay. so we are not, yeah, if it's a little better or a little worse, we, we sort of say it, it's okay, it's good enough to, uh, sub, to support our point. Yeah. The, the main point is that we can reduce the model size because it doesn't need so many parameters to predict the next exactly, one. Because yeah. it, morphology helps. That's. Yeah. That's cool. the message cool. that we're yeah. trying to. So I think it's a very nice final message given the public. And yeah, let's close the session. Thank you very much.